afternoon. Uh, my name's Patricia, as I say, and uh, I am, right, get rid of that little thing. Um, I'm the Public Engagement Coordinator for the East and North of Scotland, and I'm joined today by Sihar, my colleague, who looks after the South and West of Scotland. And our job as Public Engagement Coordinators is to make people aware of the 21,000 plus war graves we look after here in Scotland, and to encourage people to research and remember uh, and visit those uh, people when possible. So I'm just going to tell you a bit about the Commission generally, about our history, how we came to be, and then a little bit of focus on our archives, which you mentioned uh, in the talk request was an interest. And then Sihar is going to share some stories with you about some of the women that we commemorate in Scotland. So get going, our responsibilities are fair large worldwide. We look after 1.7 million war dead from both world wars in over 23,000 places in the world, 153 countries and territories. So it's a, a very large organization. We're the biggest horticultural employers in the world with probably, that's probably slightly out of date by now, eight, over 850 gardeners and uh, other staff, specialist staff, including stonemasons, bronze workers, and of course, all the office functions that we also have. And if you can begin to imagine what that huge number of square meters of grass might look like. That's the kind of work that our gardeners are doing in the year, cutting that amount of grass to keep the cemeteries looking immaculate. Our largest cemetery is Tynecourt in Belgium, which has 12,000 burials and many more names of the missing remembered on the panels there. And our smallest cemetery is, has four casualties in, and it's actually in North Carolina in America because those were four trawlermen who were helping the US Navy patrol against U-boats. So very wide range of places that we have graves and sites in. Our youngest casualties that we look after for both First and Second World War are, were 14 years old, lied about their ages, of course. The youngest from the Second World War anywhere is actually in Edinburgh, in Conway Bank Cemetery, Reginald Earnshaw. And as we discover more, we find that there were a lot of casualties we look after who were in their 60s, who will have been career soldiers, most likely, um, or sailors or airmen, of course. So a very large scale operation, uh, funded and supported by our member governments from the Commonwealth, in particular, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa and India and ourselves. And when we're talking about India, we mean what is now India, Pakistan and Bangladesh because, of course, India was partitioned in 1947 after the end of the Second World War. So worldwide commitment up everywhere. People tend to assume that the most of our work is in France and Belgium from the First World War, which is correct. But even in the First World War, there, were, there was fighting and various campaigns taking place elsewhere. Uh, and of course, in the Second World War, the theatres of war were much more wide ranging, which shows you the kind of presence we have uh, people in all kinds of countries that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So this is our hero at the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, Fabian Ware. He founded the commission really, and he was an educator and journalist who was considered too old to serve in the First World War, but volunteered with the Red Cross. And it became apparent to him as he was removing and helping casualties in the, on the Western Front, that if their graves weren't marked immediately, then they might be lost forever. So he established our principles and the book, that blue booklet there is very important to us because that was the design and the type of cemeteries, that, the proposal for that, that was put to the government of the time. So each of the Commonwealth dead is commemorated by name on a headstone or memorial. And it's a name that's really important because obviously, unfortunately, there are many thousands of casualties who are still missing but their name is recorded on a panel on one of our memorials. And it's, that's the, the key thing. Ideally, we, they would have individual graves, but where we can't do that, we remember their names. Headstones and memorials are permanent, which is why we're still working today with all the teams we have. And the, the headstones are uniform with no distinction for rank or status. So it doesn't matter whether you are a member of the aristocracy or even the royal family, who had be, attained a high rank in the military or whether you were a private or an able seaman who had just joined two weeks ago, your sacrifice is the same. So your commemoration is the same. 
Our qualifying dates, uh, if, you were, if you died between the beginning of the First World War and the end of August 1921, uh, then you would be eligible. That's because the peace treaties which ended the First World War were finally all signed by the end of August that year. And in the Second World War, it's the beginning of, of the Second World War to the end of 1947, which was the end date agreed by the member governments. And you have to be eligible to be eligible you have to have died while in military service or if you were discharged from military service if your injury or illness was directly related to it so in the first world war for example that might include somebody whose lungs had been weakened by the conditions in the trenches or by being gassed and who then later went on to contract tb or was badly affected by spanish flu uh, so those are the qualifying criteria to be entitled to a war grave other couple of key figures, Sir Frederick Kenyon, who co-wrote the blue booklet that we talked about. Uh, he was the instrumental in getting the uh, War Graves Commission established through Parliament. And Rudyard Kipling, whose own son, John, had uh, been missing and then was dead in the First World War. And he contributed the kind of literary input. For example, the saying, their name liveth forevermore, uh, was created by Kipling. So I'm sure you're familiar with this kind of image of the trenches, the terrible conditions, mud, uh, constantly moving terrain and troops, etc. And these were the original crosses that would be placed on someone's grave, usually by their own comrades. And some of those still exist even more than 100 years later. And there's one in Dean Cemetery in Edinburgh. And there's an organisation called The Returned, which collates where they are in the UK and helps to preserve them. Um, but they were not necessarily going to last very long. And in fact, some of them were burned by the troops in the trenches in the wind, first winters of the war because they had no fuel. So it was either burn those crosses or suffer from hypothermia and extreme cold. So sadly, some of them were lost. A graze registration unit, which is the start essentially of our record keeping in the commission. This is a, a party of men identifying a burial and then where, where the person was originally buried and their details and transferring them to one of our bigger cemeteries. Uh, a very difficult and no doubt unpleasant job, but fundamentally important. And this started in Europe in 1921 uh, and then moved around gradually around into the UK as well, which we'll come to. So that again, the start of recording information, these young women are in France in the Second World War and they're typing up details of where a grave is recorded, what kind of headstone it has, etc., to be stored. Um, this is one of our records and inquiries units. Wait, that's how it started. Of course, shelves and shelves and shelves of paper. Uh, unfortunately, some of this was lost in the Second World War, as were many records of all kinds, because there was a shortage of paper. So very sadly, some historic documents were pulped and reused, turned into new paper which is a bit horrifying from a historical point of view, um, but we do still have a lot of the originals left. Um, this is a mother vis visiting her son original in the 1920s. People tend to think that battlefield tours, which some of you may have been on or members of your family may have been on from school, are a new thing. But in fact, the companies like Thomas Cook started to offer those as soon as it was physically safe to do so. It's not entirely safe to, to visit the area even yet because there's a huge amount of unexploded ordnance and munitions and so on in the battlefields. But at least people were able to go, who could manage it were able to go and see where their loved one was buried. Mm. And gradually those rows of crosses that we saw earlier begin to form into the shape of a cemetery that um, you might recognize today. This is one of the first ones in Hoosh Crater in Belgium. And you can see that the rows are taking shape and the paths in between. And that's one of our gardeners beginning to establish things. And that's what the cemetery looks like now. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of scenes that you see, particularly in France, Belgium, Gallipoli, um, when you see the big remembrance services and the white Portland stone and particular kinds of planting around that. 
Originally, the headstones and memorials were all done by hand. You'll see the gentleman there is engraving a maple leaf for a Canadian casualty. And now they're done by machine uh, in our workshop uh, in Boran, just outside Arras in France. And you know that works almost all the headstones which we're installing go to the workshop there and are engraved. There's the occasional hiccup a couple of years ago, the machine there broke down. And in Scotland, we reverted to the memorial stonemasonry companies here to get headstones done. Mm -hmm. Why do we need new headstones now? Well, we sometimes have to replace them if they've become damaged in some way, but also we're still installing new headstones because we will often find that somebody has been buried locally in a churchyard perhaps over a hundred years ago, and nobody has appreciated at the time that they should have had a war grave. And there's a charity, a group of volunteers called In From The Cold, who put together all the information relating to the casualty, burial records, military records, hospital records. And then they present a case to say that this person does meet the criteria. They did die uh, out with, uh, in, sorry, inside our periods of commemoration and they should have a war grave. And that has to be processed by the Ministry of Defence. And then once they've agreed it, they will come to us and effectively commission the headstone. Uh, so we're still installing those and we like to have ceremonies wherever possible to recognise that. Our most recent one that before lockdown was in the grounds of the churchyard of Dunblane Cathedral, where we had identified that a young woman called Grace Sharp who had been with the army was entitled to a war grave and we installed that for her. And we had a very nice ceremony around that, in particular with girl guides attending because Grace had been a girl guide. Uh, so the current girl guides came to pay their respects to her and that was a nice, very nice thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, in the larger cemeteries where we have more than 40 graves, you will see a cross of sacrifice. And that was designed by Reginald Bloomfield to represent the face of the majority, which certainly in terms of uh, 100 years ago would have been assumed to be Christian unless indicated otherwise. And the Stone of Remembrance equally was designed by Sir Edmund Lutyens to represent those of all faiths and also those of none. So anywhere where there's 40 or more burials anywhere in the world, you will find something similar to that. And uh, they vary in size according to the size of the cemetery. So the layout of a headstone, I hope maybe some of you have seen these already in your local cemeteries and churchyards. Um, they're always the same shape. They have the curved top and that same dimension. If you happen to see one which has the curved top but has the corners cut out, that means that it's been installed by the Ministry of Defence and it's for someone who has died in military service but out with our period of commem commemoration. And the headstones will all have the badge, so it might be regimental badge, service badge, wings for the RAF and anchor for the Navy, as we saw before, a maple leaf for a Canadian. And then the service particulars, so the casualties name, who they were serving with, date of death. And the religious emblem, as we said, it was completely commonplace and the Norman Society 100 years ago for everybody to say they were Christian unless they were expressed a completely different belief. If somebody has uh, stated that they were Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist or any other faith, we put the symbol of that religion, of course. And if they've said no faith at all, then we would leave that blank. And there are some cases where we have installed a headstone with the cross and then the family has said, actually, no, we don't want that anymore. Uh, I think some families had their faith severely tested by the war and they didn't feel it was appropriate to have a religious symbol. The personal inscriptions are really interesting. They were like uh, Twitter. Originally families were invited to create them 66 characters and a lot of them are very conventional. They might be Bible verses or poetry or literature that was recognizable at the time, but some of them are very unusual and some we haven't really kind of tracked down the meaning of them yet. There is one in France which is in musical notation and the tune can be played on different instruments but it's not a tune that anybody recognises. And there's one in Brookwood Military Cemetery just outside London which is in code 
in the sense that it is in English words, but they don't make sense. Mm. They must only have made sense to that particular family. And there were very few inscriptions that we didn't allow. And they were ones which criticized or blamed a specific individual for the casualty's death. So Earl Hay killed my son, for example, would not have been acceptable. And there's one which, you know, there are some kind of gray areas. One mother wanted to put, he died in vain on her son's headstone. And that wasn't allowed because her son's headstone might be next to that of somebody whose family believed that they had died for a, a greater cause. And, and that was a good thing. So she changed that to, did he die in vain, question mark, and that was allowed. Mm. So very few limitations on the inscriptions. Some of them are very simple and very poignant. They just say things like our Jack, and that brings it home to you that it's an individual family member that uh, is being remembered. So the planting, and I'm hoping I'm going to talk to you at another time about the gardening and the horticulture of the commission because it's really interesting and uh, lots and lots of lovely examples. But the original concept from Gertrude Jekyll, who you may know as the designer of the White Garden at Sissinghurst in Kent, mm -hmm. uh, created, uh, she was creating what was effectively an English or British country garden in the cemeteries where possible. Uh, so she uh, suggested and designed planting that we would recognize in our own gardens. And uh, obviously that can't be used everywhere in the world because of conditions, but that's the concept that the casualty is in lying in somewhere which feels like home and their family visiting will feel at home. Mm -hmm. So moving on to the specifics of the archives, I think it's very important to us to have our archive recognized as being of international importance by UNESCO. And it's very varied. You can see my colleague Michael there on the top shelving things. And the archivists have been taking the opportunity of lockdown when head office is empty to install some very fancy new shelving, which they're extremely excited about, and new methods of storing all our very precious archives. And you've got some examples there, a book uh, with a Bible, it looks like, with a poppy from the battlefield pressed into it. And there's a staff card there. We have many, many staff who've been with the commission a very long time. And, and many in the beginning were ex-service personnel. And then there are the records, which now you can find digitally on our database, but those are the original records of the names and where people are remembered. We've got two types of archive. We've got the casualty archive, um, which records every single person for whom we have a burial or a memorial. So it's got the casualty register, the grave and memorial register. So you can see, you can look up somebody and see exactly the details of where they were buried, what type of headstone it is, etc and the headstone schedules, so again, the type, the stone that it's made of, and the commission archive, which is everything to do with the organization and has some fascinating things in it. You can easily spend ages investigating all of that. Again, I was looking at a cemetery here and found out all sorts of interesting things about the design of it and also about the staff, because a member of staff was sacked from the commission in the 1950s, and he was obviously very disgruntled about the whole thing. And his last entry in his inspection book says, stone masonry, very good, horticulture, terrible. <laughs> uh, and you think, okay, well, right, I can see why you and the commission might be parting company there. So there's all sorts of fascinating stuff in there. And there's a big photographic archive as well, uh, which we're constantly adding to. So when you go onto our website, say you want to look for a member of your family or you want to look for somebody or, or so, who is very locally, you can either go to Find War Dead or explore our archive generally. And Find War Dead, here's the page that you will find where you can put in what you know. It's sometimes better, unless somebody has a very unusual name, it's sometimes better to put less rather than more. Uh, if you're looking for a casualty called John McLeod, for example, that's going to be quite tricky because there were so many. So put in as much detail as possible. If you have an unusual name like my surname, I can just put in my surname and immediately I find the 10 members of my family who are commemorated by the commission. Mm. But that's the page that you would use to find an individual. And then you get a set of possible options coming up, Tommy Atkins and the, the Tommy Atkinsons it may be, and then you can start to narrow it down. And for each one, you'll find the record of their burial and the record of what their headstone looks like and where it is. 
if you go into the commission archive, um, you can basically find you know, anything you, you might want to know more about a cemetery, you might want to know more about something that's been decided. And when you go into to there, you'll find uh, all the options that we have. And if our archive for that particular query has been digitized, there'll be a little thumbnail at the side to see, show you that you can view it online. Because uh, obviously at the moment, nobody can go to Maidenhead. In normal times, if you're close enough or you're traveling that way, you can arrange to go in and see our physical archives. And the archivists are extremely helpful. So all sorts to be found out there. E-files, again, during lockdown, we've been gradually putting on the archive more and more information about individuals. We can't put everything that we know about on the casualty database. It would just be too huge, I think, if you think we're talking about 1.7 million individuals. Um, and also, we didn't identify the casualties. The military authorities do that. So we're dependent on what they have contributed to us uh, to be able to record any information. So if we have somebody's address or their parents' details uh, or their unit or their ship uh, on our casualty databases, because the uh, military authorities have told us that, but we're gradually trying to add more and more photographs and stories of people. And we also have some very helpful research guides. So if, for example, you want to find out somebody who is in the Air Force, you can go to our research guides and there is a specific like, article on to help you do that. And we also have lots of outside sources that we use, many of them free. Um, and you'll find reference to those in the research guides. Okay, so last little bit from me. Uh, to be commemorated, as I say, by the, by the CWGC, you must meet the criteria for eligibility, which we mentioned before. So those who died in the UK, and they did, everybody who's buried here, with a very few exceptions, died here. Repatriation was not uh, permitted after the beginning of the war, and that's a whole other story about that, about why and how controversial it was. But with a very few exceptions, people who died and are commemorated in the UK by the Commission, they died in military hospitals, uh, for example, all the big cities, our cities in Scotland had military hospitals. Training or other accidents, many of the Air Force casualties we look after, for example, died in accidents because Scotland was used as a training base for both wars. Uh, air raids like the Clyde Bank Blitz uh, are at home, so many people will have come home and with wounded or injured or ill and will have died at home. And of course, being all around our coast, in particular in Scotland, we have those who died at sea and were washed, up, washed ashore. And those are from many nationalities. In Orkney, for example, in Kirkwall and St. Olaf's Cemetery, there are people from at least half a dozen nationalities, including a Greek merchant mariner. So those are the people that we commemorate here. And war graves in the UK, you say we've seen all the beautiful Portland stone, headstones, the white ones um, in Europe. But here we tend to use different materials. We use a lot of granite in Scotland because it stands up much better to the weather. Sometimes the Portland there and sometimes other types of stone which are were available at the time or were a particular feature of that area. And just when you think, I know about this, I know a Commonwealth Wargrave headstone now, I can look for them. Then we've got private memorials. And those are where a family was had the means and opportunity and wish to bury their own war casualty uh, and have their own family headstone. But that person's name, remember the significance of the name, the name is not recorded or memorialized anywhere else. So in that instance, like with Fred Beckett here, we are uh, committed to maintaining that name. And there's a Jewish headstone there, which is quite different, but again, that individual isn't commemorated elsewhere. So you might sometimes see in the bigger city cemeteries or elsewhere, you'll see a big family headstone. And the only name that's really clear and sharp in the lettering is uh, the name of the war casualty. So sometimes it can be harder to find those in a cemetery, but there are a significant number of them. Uh, just a few of our lovely cemeteries in Scotland. This is Kinloss Abbey, burial ground there. And you can see how nicely maintained the plot is by my colleague Alan. This is our Broth West, uh, and there are quite a lot of Air Force casualties there, including four New Zealanders, because they were training um, in the air bases in Fife and Angus. 
This is Cumley Bank in Edinburgh, and again, a slight exception to the rule about a cross of sacrifice. Here in Cumley Bank, we have what's called a register box, which is commonly seen abroad, but not so common here. Uh, and that little door opens and you have a list of the casualties buried there and a visitor's book in Cumley Bank. And we also have some quite unusual and difficult to maintain flat or recumbent stones here because they're like, you know, how we have a, we might have a family layer, mm -hmm. uh, but you can use one headstone for a family layer because all the family names are the same. Whereas these are individual casualties. So to have room uh, for them all to be recorded, the stones are flat and they're all casualties from the military hospital, which was next door to the cemetery. And over to Sihar to tell you about some of the, whiz through all that, but Sihar can now hopefully tell you about some of the female casualties that we commemorate because it's not all about the men. So Sihar, over to you. Great, let me just find Sihar before I um... yeah, you can unmute I think her. Un I think I'll unmute myself. Oh. Um... Yes, hang on just a second. I'll just put, I'll just spotlight you so that you can. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, so, like my colleague, um, oops, your sound's going, Sahar. Better now. Yeah. Like my colleague mentioned, I am going to be highlighting more about the women casualties that are buried in Scotland. So, the first story that I want to share with you is that of Annie Winfred Munro. She was a member of the South African Military Nursing Service that served in West Africa, Gallipoli, and France. And um, she was born in Peter, Peter Martinsburg in South Africa to Ellen Monroe and Scottish-born William Monroe. And um, it was in France where she contracted pneumonia, and then she went to England to convalesce. Having partly recovered, she then desired to visit Scotland, which was the home of her father. She'd never been before, but she wanted to see it. But unfortunately, she was unable to travel further north in Glasgow. And she died on the 6th of April 1917. She was only 26 years old. She was buried in the Glasgow Western Metropolis with full military honours. Mm. Now, the, the next woman that I would want to highlight is a woman called Annie Dick Campbell. She served in the Women's Royal, Royal sorry, she served in the Women's Royal Navy Service, which was popularly and officially known as the REMS, essentially a branch of the United Kingdom's Royal Navy. She served with Hedgemess Carrigan. She was a Wren steward, the daughter of James and Mary Campbell of Ayr. She died of acute influenza gastritis in Scarborough Hospital, and, and she was only 19 years old. The personal inscription on her headstone reads, quick and sudden was a call without farewell to us us all. The next casualty I want to highlight is from Greenock Cemetery. She was born in England, um, and uh, her family actually moved to Greenock. Sadly, when they moved, the family met with a number of tragedies. Her father died in 1886. Her brother followed soon after. Her brother James died in London in 1895. Her younger brother also drowned. Her younger brother Patrick drowned in 1898. And her mother also died shortly after when she was staying with her daughter in Wales. It's from Eldrum, commemorated in Greenup Cemetery, but also she's also commemorated on the Fine Memorial, which was erected by members of the Health Nursing Service in St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. It's a memorial to Scottish nurses who died while on war service. She worked as a private nurse until the outbreak of the First World War, where she enlisted. She served in the Territorial Force Nursing Service and became a sister in the South Scottish Territorial Hospital, which is based in Stoughill in Glasgow. It was here where she succumbed to pneumonia after a short illness and died on 2nd February 1918. The next story is about Ellen Graham Thompson. She was born in Ayr, the youngest of four. She had two sisters and one older brother. She enlisted in Glasgow to become a worker for the Queen Mary's Army Auxiliary Corps. Her headstone on the family grave reads, in loving memory of Ellen Graham Thompson, born on 21st of August 1883, died on 20 February 1918, daughter of Archibald and Georgina Thompson. She was 35 years old. The next casualty, Monica Nancy, Jane Gross. She was buried in Aberdeen in Dyson Churchyard. And um, she joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force and was an equipment corporal in Simcoe Ring. She was travelling from an Air Force base at Stonehaven to Aberdeen, and the area of Lorraine that she was travelling struck a ball. She was thrown out and died of a fractured skull. She was 25 years old. The next casualty 
and the final casualty that I want to talk about is Margaret Watmore Barnes. She was the daughter of William and Lily Barnes and was born in Edinburgh in 1922, member of the 41st Royal Guard Unit. On her 18th birthday, Margaret enlisted as, um, as part of the Roman Royal Naval Service to the Rennes. She was sent to Scarborough. In August 1941, a group of Rennes were sent to Gibraltar on board the SS Isabella, which was sailing as part of a convoy, and Margaret was in that, on that ship. Their ship was actually hit by a torpedo which was fired by a German U-boat, and 12 Rennes, including Barnes, died at sea. She was only 18 years old. Each year on November and Sunday, a representative of this unit was a copy cross in the movie. Those were the stories that I kind of wanted to highlight to you. Um, they're just some of the women casualties that are buried in Scotland. In the next slide, I want to talk a little bit more about the Commonwealth War Base Foundation. So the Commonwealth, you, it's just showing you how you can get involved in the Commonwealth War Base Foundation. And um, we'd be delighted if you could support us in our public engagement. For a donation of £30 a year, you can join our support for scheme. All donations do go towards funding our education and public engagement programmes, which will capture the public engagement, public's imagination and highlight the work of the Commission. If you are interested in becoming a supporter or want to find out more about the foundation, the information will be there on our website. And the next slide, just we'd love to see if you've got any um, any research that you've done um, on, on casualties that are buried in Scotland. You'd be more than welcome to share it with us. Um, our email list is on here and well, as well as our Facebook um, group that is in Scotland, which you can also join. Um, if you would like to share it, you can do it on Twitter as well. Uh, you can at CWBC and Instagram as well. And again, don't forget to hashtag CWBC. If you've got any questions, me and my colleague Patricia will now love to speak. That's okay. okay, so if we stop uh, sharing there, oh yeah, you stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah stop sharing that's great um and i hope that we'll have lots of questions we did so whiz through that to keep in with your time scale but i'm hoping we'll be able to answer some questions for you yeah great that was that was fabulous thank you very much get ladies um i'll just get everyone to unmute and then we can we can uh, say thank you and then we can go on to the question <laughs> thank you very much well done no. Question. Put your hand, put your hand up, or or put your, or um use the use the tool to to um put your hand up and your reaction um however you do it. Then I, then I can come to you. Have a question. Anyone got a question? I've I've got a question, Patricia and Sahar. I'd yeah. like. To know what, what happens now? Because obviously, um, see the Commonwealth War Graves Commission deals with everyone from the First and Second World Wars, but what happens now for people who are held over to um, They're um, created, by, they're looked after by the Ministry of Defence, mm -hmm. uh, so in a very similar way to how we commemorate them, anybody who is serving now and is killed as a result of their service, when they enlist they can state whether they want a family burial or to be looked after by their family or whether they want Ministry of Defence to provide for them. And the principle is the same as ours, really, that uh, the commission was partly set up so that it didn't matter how wealthy you were. You didn't have to be able to afford to create a, a headstone of your own. It, you would always get one regardless. And the MOD work on the same principle that everybody is entitled to one. So any conflicts outside the First and Second World War are looked after by them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I did have one. Yeah, Maz, have you got one? Yeah, I did, but I forgot what it is. I'll have to think about it. I'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, Wendy, I'm going to come to you, Wendy. Uh, yes, Wendy. Yes, yeah, that Wendy. Uh, yeah. In our local cemetery at Achnebrech, we have two, what I thought were your stones, but may not be. Yeah. One is a flight lieutenant who may well be yours. I must go and check. The other one is a guy called Donkey Man Murai. Oh, He's yeah. A Japanese mm -hmm. prisoner of war who was a merchant sailor oh, who was interned in oh. Hull and then went to oh. the Isle of Man and oh, then for some reason or other ended up in 
the prisoner of yeah. local prisoner of war camp at Cairn Barn. Right. Would he be one of yours or would he be the MODs or would he be Japan's response looking after him? Well, somebody in, after him? I mean, first of all, the title document is interesting. I must admit I was extremely disappointed when I researched that a bit more and found that it was nothing to do with animals. Yeah, uh, no, so <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because there's one, there's a, a document here uh, in Edinburgh who died on Armistice Day, in first Armistice Day, and I was intrigued by him. And then I found out that the donkey man job was involving using an engine on a trawler. So not quite as exciting as I'd hoped. Um, but with that sort of thing, um, it would almost, uh, I mean, technically, if he was a Japanese citizen, it would be the responsibility of Japan. But in practice, we often have, we have a lot of reciprocal arrangements. I'll have to check on this one, or perhaps you can send me the name and I'll find out. Um, but we, for example, with Norway, there are a lot of Norwegians who are buried here and vice versa. So we have reciprocal arrangements with a lot of Nor other governments, Poland, Norway, Czechoslovakia, etc. Yeah. to care for their graves here and they would do the same uh, in their country mm -hmm. because it would make no sense at all to insist that that person was looked after by another government. And we also have some German burials here, uh, most, mostly people who were interned here. But there's a large German cemetery outside Birmingham, Canuck Chase. And also there were Germans who died in air crashes here and, um, you know, all sorts of other things. So by and large, we use a common sense approach. And if it's just one grave next to ones that we're caring for anyway, we would look after them. And we do have um, a relationship with the MOD for contracts as well. In Lucas Cemetery, anybody in Fife will know there's a long row of war graves, one side of which is ours and the other side are more recent RAF casualties. So we are contracted by the Ministry of Defence to look after them both. Mm. It makes no sense to send out two different working parties for the same site. Mm. But do send me the name of this one, please, Wendy, and I'll see what I can find out. It's a common name. I'll, I'll, send, I'll message you. Yes, do please. Yeah. Figure it out. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyone else? Maz or Maz is remembered. Yeah, yeah, I've remembered now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, can anybody go onto your site and and look for records and things? Yeah. Say, so how do you want to pick yeah. up on that one? Yeah. Um. So, um, anybody can come. Oh, your sounds. Yeah. Oh, you just on quiet. Yeah. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, anybody can, just to answer your question, anybody can access our archives and you, you will be able to search for the war graves and the war dead through our archives. But it, uh, there's also really useful guides on our website which will help you research in a little bit more detail. Um, so we can only put up in our website um, what is essentially, um, what the Ministry of Defence has provided with us or what has been provided with us originally. Um, and in order to supplement that information, you're more than welcome to look at our research guides which are also on our website. Um, and they're really, really useful because they, they help you kind of navigate through the kind of secondary resources that we can also use, like the Imperial yeah. War Museum, which is also a really good um, resource and um, that sort of thing. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had an uncle, but I don't think he's, I don't think he'd be classed as dying in action. He fell out of a troop, out of a troop train. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yeah. Well, if he was, yeah. If he was he's, in he's buried in India somewhere. Yeah, if he, um, if he was in military service at the time, yes, he would have a war grave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So again, see if you can find his name. And if yes. there are any questions that you can't answer on the website or aren't particularly clear, then our inquiries team is fantastic. They deal yes. with every kind of question, you know, yes. from all kinds of perspectives. So it's in that you can just email them at inquiries yes. at cwgc.org. Yes. He was, he was actually my grandfather's brother, and it was really amazing because my mother never, ever told me about it. Wow. But this man actually fell out of a train and there was a big inquiry as to did he fall or was he pushed? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, we only found out about it recently. Yeah. Well, it would certainly be interesting to explore yeah. a bit more, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes, we have a lady on our war memorial in Long Itry Church with mm -hmm. the Second World War and she died of gastric problems. Yeah. And because she was still in service. Yeah, that's she, right. She's mentioned on our memorial and has a grave and yeah. everything. Uh -huh. yes, that's right. Yes, I, I know the one you mean, uh, Jackie, because I come from East Lothian originally. So I, uh, Janet Stewart. Yes, yeah. Yes, but then I think a lot of and see her stories illustrate that the, the women she was talking about nearly all died of illness or yeah. accident. Uh, of course, obviously, there were far fewer combat roles for women, but a lot of them. Mm -hmm. You know, and there are some here. I was talking about one yesterday who died, who was a member of the ATS, 
in and she was training with her colleagues in Norfolk mm -hmm. and they were out doing PT on physical training on at the outside their billet and the Germans came in with a bombing raid which was too low for the air raid sirens to pick it up in time and um, there were 20 I think 30 girls young women training and only three of them survived um, and that was unfortunately not not the only bombing raid on the ATS in North so you know, an awful lot of things happening, but the majority, I would say, were injury or illness. Yeah, because yeah. I've got this one. It's the women of the First World War. Mm. Oh, yes. And the lady was a VAD. Yeah, so that'd be And sheer, my cousin sent me, by sheer chance, she's from Edinburgh. Uh -huh. So I was able to track her down. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. Yes. Daisy Kathleen Mary Coles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was on the War Days Commission this morning checking it. Oh, good. I'm glad you found what you wanted. Yeah, oh yeah, I'd, I'd already had this, but I'd lost my piece of paper. Yeah. And she was 24 and she was killed in an air raid <coughs> on the casualty station. Well, yes, and of course a lot of the women who were nursing on the front, the Western Front in particular, you know, they died in shell fire and things just like the men did because they were yeah. close to the front line. They should be nursing the poor wounded men yeah. and then the poor wounded men would be killed. You know, yeah. which is, and there is a memorial, plus there's also a memorial at uh, George Watson's, because she went to George yeah. Watson's school. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so all the schools are really, if you're trying to find somebody as well, it's very very worthwhile if you know where they went to school, looking on the school roll of honour, because they've, they're have they often very extensive. Well, I was able, because I knew she came from Edinburgh, I was on 1911 census. Yes, yeah. So mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah, plus, so um, Dr Yvonne McEwen's been very helpful. Yes, of course, well. yeah. And of course, we'll all be very excited when the 1921 census comes out, which will be January next year, because that will begin to help us find out what happened to people after the war. Because mm -hmm. are they releasing it next year? Because I don't know if they've been yeah. working on it this year. Yeah, it's been. It'll be Jan. It's always the January after yeah. the year. But yes. Yeah, so yeah. So. Because I don't know if they've been working on it with people being on furlough. Well, I think they'll they'll have been doing it remotely as well. Yeah. Yeah. From their very from their homes. Yeah. The date. Because poor, poor Daisy lost her big brother as well. Oh dear, yeah, and so many families like that. Yeah, yeah it's quite sad. And behind me in Long Nidry, just to the back garden, we've got a veterans housing. Yes, yes. Built in 1917 to 1919, yeah. and uh, it's, it's, when we research, it's very sad. Yeah, oh, it is, yeah. I mean, one of my, <coughs> my relations whose husband went missing at Passchendaele and was never found, she ended up moving into uh, veterans housing in Shetland and Lerwick and it's still sheltered housing even now. Oh um, yeah, we're always veterans housing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and the history of that, and like we've got Erskine as well now in Scotland, of course. Um, any more questions? Yes, yeah, sorry, Pam, you've got your hand up. Pam. I'm, um, I'm from Cannock in Staffordshire, so I've been around the German cemetery around oh, Cannock yeah. quite a number of times. But uh, I now live up at Mintlaw in Aberdeenshire, and I'm a member of the British Legion from Longside. Mm -hmm. And we've got war graves in Longside Cemetery, which we have a parade for every May. But a couple of years ago, one of the um, graves was identified, well, not identified, was found out by from a family in Canada. Yeah. And they came over, and we did a parade with them. And oh, they'd come lovely. over to see their family relative that was buried in Longside. And it, yeah, was, yeah. it was lovely to hear the story. They, oh, they yeah. haven't got somebody local to fly them around and the area to see where he'd been billeted oh, when he was over here. Oh, it was yeah. really interesting to hear. Yeah. Your oh, yeah, story yeah. was brilliant. Yeah. yeah, that's very, and in fact, if you get a chance to share that with us through, um, and I'm just wondering if I can put my, my name Sihar's email in the chat. Yeah. Um, Let's see that. Because, that like, um, uh, I would love to know more about that. Particular. I'll take that interest. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sihar. Yeah, they, they did a news paper article on it when it happened as well so I can be able yeah, to I'd love to hear more about that yeah. and of course Sihar and I haven't yet been lucky enough to go to Canuck because of everything that's going on mm -hmm. um, our colleague Sarah there um, who looks after the Midlands area she's been many times but it's somewhere I'd really like to visit mm -hmm. so, yeah. well if you can say a cemetery is beautiful it is beautiful as I say yeah. I was born and bred down there so we used to go around we used to have school parties go around and everything yeah. so yeah oh. I've been to it on um, a number of occasions. Yeah, and in terms of what we'd like you to do is, you know, as we both said, 
share your local stories with us, tell us what you're doing locally. And, you know, we're all very keen once lockdown's over. To, normally we would be out and about around the country. We'd be talking to individual brands. I mean, it's fantastic to have the opportunity to talk to you all when you're in different parts of the country. But also it's really nice to be able to go to a local branch or, a lo you know, whether it's a Legion branch, an SWI branch, a church, whatever, and talk to people face to face about their local context as well. Yeah. So, but please do share with us everything that you're doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, we always say remembrance isn't only about November. It's about taking, um, taking an interest in casualties uh, all year round, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anne's got the hand up. I'm going to go to Anne now. Anne for this okay, yes. uh -huh. um, I was just going to say how useful it was, the, um, the website in uh, Tracing Family History. Yes. My grandmother was one of um, 13 children and uh, two of them were, were killed in the First World War. So we were able to get, um, I don't know if you can see that because, oh, there we are. Gotcha. Um, you know. Uh, yeah, the certificate. Of, yeah. of where they were buried and everything, which of course we, we haven't got from family history because it was so long ago. Yeah. Um, so yeah. really Lovely interesting. Lovely to have those, Thank isn't you. it? That's very interesting. Thank you. Good. I'm glad you found it useful. It was. Margaret? Um, for, any, for anybody who's interested, um, I live in Perth. Perth Academy has a war memorial and there's been a huge ongoing, you probably know about it. We know Other Dave people might, very not, well. yeah. might not know about it. I've been helping a little bit because uh, my mother knew quite a lot of the people. But for anyone who doesn't know, um, since the first, the 100th anniversary of the First World War, they have gone through all the names, they've researched it, and on the anniversary of that person's death, they've heard, held a little ceremony and tried to invite family members. They're now working on the Second World War, and one of the pupils discovered that I think one of the casualties from the First World War had lived in the house she lives in now, wow. and they went... They, school went on a battlefields tour and she took a brick from her house wow. and left it in this man. They were having work down, done on their house and she picked a bit of a broken brick and took it with her um, and left it on his grave. So it was a little bit of oh. care. Yeah. So I think it's a fabulous, uh, I kind of got involved because my mother was a land girl and although I didn't lose anyone, um, you know, they're hoping to extend it to things like land girls, you know, just to yeah. give the youngsters yeah. a feeling yeah. of life during the Second World War. Yes, and there's a, been a fantastic amount of research that Dave Dykes yeah. and everybody have done in that. Yeah. Um, I work quite a lot with him and he invited me to one of the Flowers of the Forest ceremonies yes. at school. Yes, yeah, Dave Dykes. Project. Olive, you were next, I think. Oh, just to say that uh, I live on in Tuamori on the Isle of Mull. And off Mull, there's an island called Alva. And off Alva, there's another island called Gometra. And there is a war grave cemetery there. It's very small. It's very remote. I think there's only two, two actual stones in it. But it's, and I've got photographs of it. It's probably one of your smallest and most remote. Yes, um, yeah, we've got quite a few islands. There's one off the north coast, Stroma as well, but as you say, that we know we still look after the graves on the island. Yes, it, it, somebody it, goes out in a wee the boat. Rest, the rest of the graveyard is quite overgrown, mm -hmm. but the Commonwealth bit, somebody local is obviously going in and yes. tidying it up. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the other question I had was always, always on the West Coast, there are lots of cemeteries where there are stones to people who have not have no names, known, known unto God, it yeah. says. Um, are they part of your remit? Yeah. They, yes. yes, and they will most likely be sailors who have been yes. washed up but yes. couldn't be identified. Yes, one, uh, one of somebody here on a certain day of the year, it's the, when the, the maritime, the, the seamen who weren't in, in, in the war, the, the yeah. merchant seamen, that's the one of the merchant, he, he was a merchant seaman yeah, and his merchant he goes around all these merchant seaman graves on near Remembrance Sunday yeah. with a little cross. <laughs> well, just, again, just, just him on his own. So, yeah. Well, again, he please share that. Into, he can't well. get into his uniform now, but he used to go around <laughs> wearing his uniform <laughs> and putting his little cross 
on yeah. these so that's ongoing lovely. grievances, um, which is really nice. And tell Sihar more about that because that's her area. So, yeah. uh, Irene. Uh, I, I live in Bridge of Weir in Renfrewshire. Yeah. A group, you, I don't know if you've heard of this story, yeah, but a group good. of um, uh, from our church I'm on uh, Zoom. I'm at... uh, decided to research the names on the war memorial mm -hmm. in the church. And then they took it further and researched the names on the war memorial in the village. And they produced a book, the name of which escapes me. I do have a copy of it. Um, I, they produced a book about all the people who were killed and um, uh, uh, produced articles in the local paper every week about a different person and told us a bit about the story. And it was very, very interesting. And I thought it was really um, quite something for that group just to put so much work into producing something like this for everyone to be able to see. And they actually arranged for a couple of walks around the village. They took around the, the houses of where, in some cases, you know, there were two or three children in the one family. Oh, yeah. Died, uh, very young. And it was, it was um, yes, it was very, very nice to, to mm. hear these stories. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and that again is something that's lived in our village. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will want to know more about because that's in her region. Yeah, and, yeah. Really, I think the emails on the chat. Like, try to try to get the email off the chat. I mean, I mean, right? Okay, me. I'll go and get the book actually, and I'll, I'll write the name of it on the chat. Okay. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. And so many. And thank you. Yeah, the talk was bit, both of you fascinating. It really thank was. Thank you, Irene. Great. So many people have done so many huge pieces of research in very small areas, but tell you so much about that community. Yeah. Uh, it's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. you, told, you told me a story when we first spoke on the phone. Uh -huh. You told me a story about a lady that had uh, gone to find her father in Thailand, I think. And he was a. Oh, yes, yes. That's right. It was a lady in a, in a branch of the SWI who had asked who had asked me to find out where her father was buried. And it was quite a long, complicated story. But basically, she had, she had been adopted as a young child and uh, and didn't know her parents, either of her parents, because they were killed when she was a baby. And she had the impression that her father was buried in one particular place. And when we researched it, we found out that this wasn't the case at all, that he, he'd actually been captured by the Japanese and was uh, buried uh, in Thailand. And oh. we were working on the, the, the Burma Railway. So sometimes, you know, the, that's the danger of investigating something. You, you know, you have these anecdotes that pass down through your family. And sometimes it's not actually the story that you think it's going to be. No. Um, and that was, you know, it's quite a difficult thing to process for her because it was turning upside down what she thought. But in the end, what she was really happy with was that we had a commemoration for her father. Mm -hmm. you know, so we knew exactly where he was. She was, I, my colleague in Thailand, went and put some flowers on the grave for her and uh, took a photograph of it and sent it to her. And that gave her some peace of mind, really, that she knew, knew yeah. where he was. Yeah. But it's just, you know, research doesn't always take you down the path you think it's going to. No. And do you do, do you, I, I was watching a programme on DNA last night and I was just wondering if, if, the, if there's any sort of uh, DNA element to your, to your role? Uh, not really. Um, several reasons. People watch all these, you know, the forensic programs and like CSI and they think, oh, why don't we use DNA? But in the first place, we have no remit to do that. So say it's the military authorities who identify remains or a casualty. And also there isn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily possible to use DNA with, especially with First World War remains, because they might be too degraded for anything left. And also the other thing is, if we don't know who they are, we don't know who their family is, we've nobody to compare them to. Uh -huh. you know, we might know within a parameter that there are X people who are missing in this area who were involved in that battalion and that on that day. Yeah. But they might not have descendants by the nature of things. They were killed too young in their lives to have had their own families. So it may well be that it isn't possible for us to find anybody to match DNA with. Uh -huh. We don't do that anyway. Say forensic, like the Joint, Joint Compassionate Casualty Care Centre, which is like a branch of the MOD, do work with the Belgian and French governments to identify people, but that's not actually our role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and to say the DNA thing is not as straightforward as TV would have us believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. no, I, I know that. <laughs> yeah. so, Irene, did you, did you find you Irene's found the book, Irene? Irene's back. Hello, Irene. 
Uh -huh, yes, I'm, I'm typing in now. Okay, okay. thought you were going to show us it, but that's fine. So, um, well, we'll wait for it. We'll wait for it. Has anyone else got any, any questions? Oh, yeah, Anne. Hello, Anne. Hello. Yes, thank you both very much. That was a most interesting talk. Mm -hmm. I visited a time court and Teep Val and Bowman Hamill with school pupils mm -hmm. on various occasions and as you said the gardens the cemeteries are kept in such beautiful condition mm -hmm. and it's amazing you know when you see the names on the plaques how it affects the pupils they really are really overwhelmed aren't they? Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah but uh, the commission does a wonderful job and one one time we went over uh, we stopped at Bowman Hamill and there's a gentleman there having a look at all the different graves and just seeing what work had to be done. And he was going back to, mm -hmm. to pass on this information. And he was excellent. He came onto the coach and spoke to the pupils and told them what the commission's work was and, and how everything was carried out. It was, it was absolutely it was fascinating. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, really, the, the cemeteries are beautifully kept. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful experience to go mm -hmm. and yeah, see. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And yeah. while it's very different circumstances in the UK because we don't have the large cemeteries that mm -hmm. we, we have, you know, we have Linus and we have on Norkney and we have Stonefall and Harrogate and Brookwood and outside London, but the majority of the UK graves are in much smaller plots. Yes. But as you've seen, hopefully from the photographs we showed you and also your own visits that our gardeners here particularly strive to keep the same standard wherever they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing they like better than somebody saying, um, the, I was surprised to find this plot in Scotland looking the same way as the European ones mm -hmm. because we're always trying to maintain that standard. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you've enjoyed those trips and oh, our yeah. were helpful. That's great. Very, very helpful. It was wonderful. Hello, Janet. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Hello. Hello. Um, I, I can, it's great to go on the Commonwealth Graves website. Um, this is a picture of my great uncle who was killed in the First World War. Mm. I knew his name and his regiment. And from there, I was able to establish that he was buried in Etap, you yeah. know, southwest of Boulogne. And they uh, took the kids there. And just as the previous lady said, they were in awe of the fact, you know, is he really there? I went, well, that's to commemorate that he died, you know, near mm. here. Oh, right, okay. And the interesting thing was I've just refurbished the house and it was the house that this man was brought up in. Wow. That's and when we, took the, when we took the roof off, there was one of these hats in the raft. Oh, wow. Oh. So <laughs> we kept that. And then when the roof went back on, it's in amongst the insulation because obviously it was there for a reason so we just wanted to put it back mm -hmm. and the other thing I found was one of these and it's a oh um, yeah yeah and it's yeah. thanking thanking him for his service and yeah. things like that um and it's quite it's quite humbling when you you know you read that and you think oh my goodness um and I am fortunate that I live two miles from Kinloss Abbey and it's the most wonderful, calming cemetery that there could ever be. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's true that there's a secret passage from there to Pluskerden Abbey. I'm not sure, <laughs> but <laughs> well, it's certainly it's certainly a wonderful cemetery. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is possibly not a great adjective to describe a cemetery. Well, you know, I think I think we kind of allow ourselves to call them wonderful, yeah. don't we? And funnily enough, I actually gave a talk to some scouts uh, from Kinloss last night, and I'm talking to another group from Kinloss next week. So it's nice to know that everybody in the area really appreciates this. Oh, it's 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 just wonderful, and and there you've got the mixture of MOD and Commonwealth graves. Yeah, yeah. because there's obviously been one or two Shackletons and things met That's their fate. Right. Yeah. 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 And it is unusual in, in terms of our war graves, there are only two of the 73 which aren't RAF. And there's one sailor and one Marine, and there's only one First World War grave there as well. And yeah. He was buried there because his wife came from Kinloss. Uh, and all yeah. of them are RAF. 
Um, yeah. You know, that reflects the fact, as I mentioned, that Scotland was used as a training base for the area yeah. both because of the terrain, the mountains yeah. and the rocks and everything, and also because it was outside the reach of the German radar. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the training, there were casualties. The four in our broth, or two of those ones in our broth that we looked at, the New Zealanders, they actually died because they were testing a new aircraft and the ventilation system was faulty. Mm. And they just got ether coming into the cabin instead mm. of air. Mm. They will just have gone to sleep and known nothing. And mm -hmm. some miracle where they crashed was not on any houses or anything like that. But, you know, that was the kind of thing that happened. And children are often a bit disappointed with that, to be fair. You know, they'll say, did he die in a Spitfire battle? You know, <laughs> was, it, was it in a dogfight? I mean, well, actually, sorry, no. <laughs> yeah, it was like, um, my son was fascinated as to how his um, great, great uncle, how did he die? And I said, well, it said it was a sniper bullet, you know. Oh, where did the bullet hit? I said, I don't know, but he died. I know. <laughs> I know, and younger children particularly are so, you know, they've got no hesitation asking that kind of stuff, you know. I've yeah. taken, taken primary schools into a cemetery and they're saying, are we standing on dead people? Well, yes, that's kind <laughs> of <laughs> And so, they've got no kind of, you know, inhibitions about Definitely it. not. I mean, I used to, I used to work in um, uh, Pollock Park. They, they, they did yeah. be a, a, a kind of, it was a World War One heritage story that they did and then they, they, they made replica trenches uh -huh. an English trench and a German trench and, and there was just primary school children they just come up with them outlandish questions really yeah, they, <laughs> pretended, they pretended that they were the English soldiers that were